And now, if you could please give a warm welcome to Sister Miriam James Heidland. Good afternoon, how's everybody? You guys having a good time? <laughs> well, you look fabulous, I must say. A little vitamin D never hurts anybody, huh? Especially in the Northwest. Uh, before we begin, I would like to, as usual, start out with a prayer. But what I'd like to do is... Um, I like to give a few moments of silence before I begin because the most important thing you're going to hear in this 45 minutes is not what I'm going to say, it's what the Holy Spirit's going to say to you. And He will speak to you if you listen. And it's very difficult for us to listen when we're always surrounded in noise. So what we'll do is we'll make the sign of the cross, we'll spend a few moments in silence, and then I'll lead us in a prayer and then a Hail Mary. Okay? All right, let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, we are your children. We are your beloved sons and daughters, and we are loved. And we're loved not because of what we do or what we don't do, but because that's how you love. You love deeply, authentically, and eternally. Please carry us in your arms and allow us to rest close to your heart. And may we find in your heart that place of rest, of safety, of security, of refuge, and strength. We bring to you all of our concerns and worries, our pain and our sorrow. We bring to you our hopes and our dreams, our great destiny and our divine mission. And we ask the Holy Spirit to come and set us on fire with the power of his love, to inspire us, to breathe life into us, and to reveal your greatness in our intense littleness. May we live life, life loved, and may we know the truth of who we are, and may this eternal truth set us free. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Peace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I am absolutely delighted to be here with you this weekend and I'm going to give three talks and I'm going to frame them in the beginning with questions I'm going to ask you. There's not going to be an exam later so don't worry about it, okay? But these questions come from the very heart of Christ. In our answers to these questions, the answers that we give not with our mouths or what we say, but the answers with how we live our lives profoundly affects how alive we truly are. St. Irenaeus said the glory of God is man fully alive fully alive. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the course of these three talks. To share with you a little bit about myself, I'm not a 12-year-old wearing a habit. Sometimes people are like, do you have your driver's license? I'm like, yeah, I'm actually really old. And um, I, uh, I am a perpetually professed member of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. If you've heard of Father John Carapi, raise your hand. You've heard of Father John Carapi? All right. <laughs> You got some crappy lovers here. Yeah. Um, you know, we're in the same community, but we're not like BFFs or anything. I've only met him once. So everybody's like, how's Father Karapi? I'm like, dude, I don't know, because I don't see him, you know? But he's, so many men have come to our community because of him, because of his intense, passionate witness of truth. And the truth comes to set us free. The truth is naturally attractive. The truth is beautiful. The truth is demanding, but it's beautiful. And we do not have to water our faith down or water the teachings down or like Tim Staples was saying, water Christ down to some sort of effeminate man to get people to, to come to the Catholic Church. All we have to do is present the truth as it is and it's beautiful and people will come. They will come. Um, I par I'm part of a brand new missionary community. Our community was founded in 1958 by Father James Flanagan. We're a poor missionary community. We serve in different parts of the world, and we do whatever work the bishop asks us to do. I, I personally, I live at, in Seattle. I live near downtown Seattle at St. Alphonsus Parish in Ballard. I'm the head of novitiate there, so the women that are coming, just making their first um, entrance into religious life, wearing a habit and a veil, their first year as novices, they come to St. Alphonsus, and they work in the school there, and they learn what it means to be a sister, what it really means to be like. And I've had 17 novices come over the past six years. Wow. 
and this group coming now, there are nine novices, and I can't uh, support nine novices, so they split the class in half. So four of them are coming to Seattle, and the other five are being sent to another mission. And so when people say that there's a vocations crisis in the church, I think it depends on <laughs> where you look, where you look. Because the communities that, by the grace of God, are living the truth, because what women want today Women, you know, as a woman today, you can have a six-figure income. You can have the handsome husband and the 2.5 kids and the house and the cars, and you can have all that, you know. Why would you give up something beautiful like that for something watered down or lukewarm? You won't. You won't. And the women coming today, the women of all ages, we don't have an age limit in our community. So women of all ages are coming because they want to live in authentic discipleship. They want daily mass. They want daily rosary. They want the Eucharist. They want to be faithful to the magisterium of the church. They want to love Our Lady. They want to serve the poor. They want to wear a habit. They want to live authentic religious life. And they're coming. They are coming to live this authentic life, to follow Christ, the bridegroom. And that's what I, that's what I was looking for in my heart. Um, I didn't always want to be a nun, as you'll find out. <laughs> but God had other plans for me, and here I am before you. I also spent a couple years coaching volleyball at Archbishop Murphy High School a few years ago, which was interesting. And, um, but I'm too busy to do that now, unfortunately, so I don't get to do that. But I do get to come and spend time with fabulous people like yourself. So it's a trade-off. Um, being a nun in Seattle and wearing a habit is always interesting. And, uh, you know, wearing a habit is a, a privilege that God has given me. And it's a deep honor and privilege. It's not a right. And sometimes people come up to me and say, oh, man, rock on, you wear your habit, you know. And, I, yeah, that's great. But you know what? It's very, it's a deep, deep privilege for me. Because what it is is a sign that God is alive and well. It's a sign. What I am a sign is a consecrated woman that I've given myself totally for all eternity to Jesus Christ forever. My life is a sign of what we will all live in heaven. And I hope you find that um, enjoyable, because <laughs> if it's not, that's why religious that never smile, isn't that kind of disconcerting? You're like, oh, I really want to go to heaven now. Uh -huh. That's sweet, you know? Because, you, or you see like people that are very worldly, it's, it's disconcerting, because you know that we should be assigned to you, and you have a right to expect that of us. You have a right to come to us and find Christ. You're not going to come to me for beauty tips or fashion ideas. You know, I have some, but, you know, you're probably not going to want to hear them, you know. What you're going to come is because you're looking for Christ. And you should be able to find him in my life, and you have a right to that. And so this habit that you see is a sign that I've given my life to Christ. This is like a wedding ring. It's a sign that I've given my life totally to Christ, and my life is no longer for myself. So when I go to the grocery store and I see a wedding ring on your hand, I don't have to ask you if you belong to somebody and they belong to you forever. I know that. So you look at me and you see my life and you know that I've given my life for something and it reminds you of God. Now, sometimes it's whether you like it or not. And in Seattle, one of the most unchurched areas in the entire United States, you get a lot of kind of diverse um, reactions. And I'll share with some of you, I'll share them with you as we go on, but one of them is just really cute, you know. Because I'll go to Catholic schools a lot of times and the kids will be like, dude, what are you? Like, what, what are you wearing? What is that that you're wearing? And so people don't know, you know. And this one woman came up to me one time, and she was just so happy. And she comes up to me, and she's like, Sister, you are just so cute in your little outfit. I love it. And I, um, you know, they kind of do, like, the whole endangered species thing. Like, they want to pet you, kind of like you're on National Geographic. You know, like, oh, can we just touch you? It's just, I mean, it's cute, because they don't ever see nuns, you know. So it's, it's an honor. But it makes me laugh. It's just really cute. And it reminds me that my life is not about me, okay. This is, goes far beyond me. And actually, in spite of me, God usually does most of his best work <laughs> when he goes beyond me. But one question I want to ask you as we begin, and it's something that I ask myself often. I ask myself this question every day. And it's a question that Jesus asks his disciples. And if you look in the beginning of the Gospel of John, I'll read you this passage. It says this. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. <laughs> The two disciples heard what he said and followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following him, and he said to them, What are you looking for? I'd like to ask you the same question. What are you looking for in your life? What is the deepest desire of your heart? What are you looking for? And when somebody asked me that question for the first time, I wanted to answer right away off the top of my head these like ideas that I should be looking for this or I shouldn't be looking for that. And she was like, shh, 
Just sit with that, like Our Lady ponders things. Let your heart ponder that. What are you really looking for? Because I'm not really here to, I'm not here to talk about myself. I'm here to talk about you. I'm here to talk about your destiny from God, that you are planned to be here on the face of this earth. And if you don't do the work, if you don't fulfill the mission that God has given you, he's not going to raise somebody else to do your work. You are meant to be here. You have a mission in life that God wants you to find out what that is. And that's between you and God. Nobody can answer that question for you. He wants us to know that we're deeply, deeply loved by God. And in a world today that is so broken, the relationships are so just disposable, people drop each other when any sort of little suffering comes up, that is so deeply wounding, and we're called to more. And I think, you know, in our hearts we desire that, we yearn for that, because it's an echo of eternity. But so often in our lives we're wounded so much, so after a while we just don't even want to go there anymore. And I'm not talking about emotions, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the deep desire of our heart. So as I speak to you this weekend, I ask you just to keep that question in your mind. What is, ask yourself, maybe you've never asked yourself that. What is the deepest desire of your heart? What are you really looking for? Because there's a reason why there are so many times in the Bible that God says, be not afraid. And that's the first thing John Paul II said in his pontificate. Be not afraid. Don't be afraid. There's great things for us to discover. And when I think of that, it fills me with hope. And it kind of reminds me of the <coughs> Frank Sinatra song, The Best Is Yet To Come. You know, And I think of my own life, and I think of my past, and I think of hope for the future. And indeed, that is true for all of us. The best is yet to come. And you know what? Twelve years ago, I was sitting where you are sitting now. And I had just graduated from college. My life was a complete and total mess. My heart was shattered. My, it was a disaster. And I said to my mom, Mom, mom let's go do something spiritual, which she was kind of like, maybe I had three heads or something. No, like where I came from, she's like, who's my dog? Who's this? You know? So we came here. And you know what? I sat on the grass here and I heard Mary Beth Bonacci speak. And I said to my mom, Mom, I want to do that one day. Here I am, 12 years later, as a nun. Who knew, you know? It's kind of shocking, really, you know? So, the moral of the story is, be careful what you wish for. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. So, I grew up in a Catholic home. Um, we were cradle Catholics and my mom and dad were very strong Catholics. My mom was, you know, diehard all of her whole life, and she's a total rock star. And my dad converted to marry my mom. And um, you know what? They made us go to Mass every Sunday. Can you believe that? Every, we had to go to Mass every Sunday. We'd be camping out in the middle of nowhere. There'd be, like, civilization nowhere to be found. My mom would be like, we found a Mass to go to. And my brother and I were like, you know? But, like, we're on vacation. I mean, you know, cut us a break here, okay? We're camping. My mom's like, no, we're Catholic. We don't take a vacation from Mass. <laughs> so my brother and I would be like, you know, skulk along and sit in the back because mass was so boring and I didn't even understand what it was about and I didn't want to go. And as I got older, my mom, who definitely wears the pants in our family, she told me that if I didn't go to mass on Sunday, I would be grounded the next weekend and she meant it. Okay, so I had to debate whether going out and partying with my friends on the weekend was worth it, going to Mass one hour on Sunday, I could sit in the back, chew gum, and just, you know, not pay attention. Okay, I'll do it, right? It was very begrudging, because I was so poorly, cate just so poorly catechized. And you know what, when I was a senior in college, <laughs> I had a boyfriend who, his dad was a Southern Baptist, okay? Talk about anti-Catholic, all right? And this guy, man, he would always challenge me. In the end, you know, it helped, because it's probably one of the reasons why I'm here. But he'd be like, oh, you Catholics, you guys worship Mary. I'd be like, really? <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe we do. I don't know. You know, I'd look at my, uh, st you know, but I mean, this is pretty typical, don't you think? It's pretty typical. Because I didn't know. I had no idea. And even though my mom told me what the truth was, I knew it in my head, but I did not believe that when the priest takes that piece of bread and he prays that prayer, when he said, this is my body given up for you, that truly becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Oh, I had no idea. And I didn't know that when you go to confession, you meet the heart of Christ in the confessional. The priest sits on the throne of mercy. And when you go and you speak the truth, and you don't play games, you speak the truth of where you suffer and where you've sinned and where you're wounded and where you've wounded other people, that not only does God forgive our sins, he gives us, gives us extra grace so we can be stronger in the future, and he wills to remember our sin no more. So that means on the day you die, God's not going to bring up what you did when you were 14. Because we do that to each other, don't we? Five years ago, you forgot our anniversary. I remember what you did. You know, because we love to hold grudges. But God, he's not like that. God doesn't love us like that. 
He wills to remember our sin no more. And I had no idea that was our faith. But I wasn't bored about everything in life. <clears throat> I liked boys and sports. So when I was in middle school, I started playing volleyball. Does anybody play volleyball here? Oh my gosh, yay! Okay, a couple people play volleyball. And so by the time I was in high school, I started playing club volleyball, where your parents pay obscene amounts of money and sit on the bleachers for 500 hours. And it's all in the hopes that you get a college scholarship, but nobody ever tells you that only 1% of all high school athletes get a college scholarship, okay? So my mom and dad sat on the bleachers for 500 hours, and they paid tons and tons of money for me to play sports, but it paid off for them. Because when I was a senior in college, I was offered a full scholarship to a Division I university. And I thought that... Well, this is big. This is big time, right? So I thought when I signed that scholarship, I was going to go to college 800 miles away from my parents, 800 miles away from mom and dad who couldn't make me do what I didn't want to do anymore. I thought, my oh, I've arrived now. My life is about to take off. All my dreams are about to come true. And you know what? For a while, I believe that they were. I went to, went to a small town girl. I grew up in Woodland, Washington, small town near Portland, Oregon. Small town girl at this Division I university. And the, when I played in that conference, there were four teams in the top 25 in the nation. I used to compete against somebody who's won two gold medals in Olympic beach volleyball. I had a boyfriend on the football team who was a star of the football team. He was really cute, really good looking guy, okay? <laughs> I got good grades in school. I partied all the time. And do you think I went to mass on Sunday anymore? I was out, you know, because mom and dad couldn't make me anymore. So I was out. I loved MTV. I loved fashion magazines. I loved Glamour magazine. I loved all that kind of stuff. I bought into the lie that tell, the world tells us what will make us happy. If you're young and you have possessions and if you're thin and if you have a good looking boyfriend or a girlfriend and you do whatever you want, you don't have to go to mass. You don't have to go to church because God just sucks the fun out of everything, you know. You will be happy. And I bought that lie hook, line, and sinker. And you know what? What I found, at the heart of it all, at times in my life, maybe 2 o'clock in the morning, I'd come back from some bar or some party or something, and it would be silent. And I never liked silence. But in that silence, what I realized is that I was broken and empty, and that I had been lied to. And I thought something was wrong with me. I was like, okay, something's wrong here. Let's do a little mental calculation. So one day I was doing just that. And I was sitting there and I was thinking, okay, I got this good looking boyfriend, I do well in school, I got this full scholarship, I play volleyball, I party all the time, don't have to go to church. What's wrong with me? And I had an experience that changed my life forever. At that very moment, God, I, I can only explain it, is God piercing my soul. And I saw myself when I died. And I saw that the day that I die, which, you know, that's part of life, you know, the day that I die, that God is not going to ask me about mommy and daddy. Because up until then, it was very immature, very rebellious of like, you can't make me, I'm going to do what I want to do, you know, how you are when you're like 18 or 19, you're just totally, in, you know, ignorant. You think you know everything, but you know, you don't. And um, I just saw that God was going to hold me accountable for my own decisions. And you know what? I knew that I was living in sin. I knew it. Don't we know the difference between right and wrong? We know it. And sometimes we try to play it off, man. We try to play it off. Even as I get older, I try to play it off and say, oh, that's not really a sin. Or that. We know it. It's in our hearts. And I knew it. I was living in open, mortal, dark sin. But the opinions of other people were too important to me for me to do what was right. I wanted to be liked. I wanted to fit in, you know. I wanted to believe what the world said. I was afraid of God. I didn't understand. I didn't want to go d dig in my faith. I just wanted to be, quote, unquote, happy. And it was, it was an empty, an empty lie. And so from that moment, I've, I've said before, I wish I could say it was kind of like a St. Paul moment where I like fell off the bed and was like, woo, I went blind and I was resurrected or something, you know. But that didn't happen. I was still blind for many years. But what it did is it gave me a focal point in my life. So I began to say, all right, okay, if this, if there must be more to life than this. There must be more to life than this. And I began a very deep search, a three-year search for the truth. And I was still struggling with sin on many levels. I was still dealing with a lot of brokenness. But something within me was like, I, I, gotta, I gotta find out what the truth is. So I began to go to Mass again on Sunday. And I began to read the Bible, or read the Catechism. It was very, very slow. But what ultimately changed my life was God sent somebody in my life who authentically loved me. He sent a man who loved me. He sent a Catholic priest. And this man changed my life.
Because the first time in my life, aside from my own father, a man loved me just for me. And that's what I was looking for. And all these relationships, all this brokenness that I was engaging in, what I was looking for was true love. I was looking for the love that satisfies. That's what my heart was yearning for. I just wasn't finding it. And this priest didn't love me because I, what I looked like or what I didn't look like or what I could give him, what I couldn't give him. He just came and he loved me. And he loved me in my sin. And he wasn't afraid of it. And he never shamed me. And he never condemned me for it. But he always challenged me to live a better life. And what I saw in his life was not so much what he said to me, but how he lived his life. And there's many things, I know I work in a Catholic school, this is my seventh year working with children, you know, and what I've learned, if I've learned anything, is that kids, we can say what we want to say to them, but the kids watch us. My novices, they know what kind of tea I drink. I mean, for real, like they're always watching. What they notice is how we live our life. So we can say, say what you want to say, but if I'm not authentically working on a conversion within, allowing this transformation to come forth from within, it's going to be empty. And that's what John Paul II reiterated, that the world, what the youth want today, they don't want teachers, they want witnesses. And if they will listen to teachers, it's because they're witnesses. And this man, Father Pinto, was a witness to me. And he came and he loved me. And I want to say that he loved me out of my sin. Because at that point in my life, as I got, had gotten along, there was a battle literally from the pits of hell raging in my life. I was struggling with alcoholism. I was struggling with deep lust in my life. I was broken. I would wake up in the morning wishing I was dead. And I didn't know where else. My friends didn't have the answers. And I wasn't, I wasn't rooted enough in Christ. I didn't know what to do. And this man loved me. And he never gave up on me. Never gave up. Sounds like somebody we know, Christ, huh? That he comes and he never gives up on us. And he loves us. He loves us rightly. And I believe from that example of love, I believe in the power of authentic love. Of, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about what love is and what it's not. But I believe in the transforming power of authentic love. The kind of love that sacrifices itself. The kind of love that is not afraid of death. The kind of love that gives and gives and gives. That transforms people. And it transformed me. And when I graduated from college, Father had invited me down to our, um, a mission in New Mexico. And he said, why don't you just come down and spend a few days here, you know? So I was like, yeah, whatever, you know? And uh, I was afraid of silence, because it's really quiet at that mission. <laughs> you know, I mean, you always had the TV on, or I had the radio, something always on, because I couldn't stand the silence, because that's when the truth would come out of my heart, right? So I always had to have some sort of background noise on, or something on, because I couldn't stand the silence. But when I got down there, I was amazed. It just, it was so healing, and it was so quiet. And at this particular mission, at the same mission, were also the men who were becoming priests. They were novices. And these men were my age. And they were like, cool, right? And they wanted to be holy. They wanted to be priests. And they were good looking, too. I was like, what? What's up with this, you know? Or even hiding these guys. No, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> but I was, look, I was watching these people my age. Like, these men my age, th they went to daily mass, and they prayed the rosary, and they were so noble. And just the experience of that, and the experience of the silence, and the experience of being around Father and being around the other sisters, it was in that silence that I heard Jesus call me. And I wasn't planning on it. People, I, I wanted to work at ESPN or CNN. I wanted to be a CEO of a company. I wanted to be a, a wealthy businesswoman. I, that was my plan for my life, and I was well on my way. But I heard Jesus call me. And when he called me, you know what, I, all I kind of liken it to is with, um, you know how you have a puzzle, I've, I've maybe heard you tell you the story before, you have like a puzzle, right? And you do this puzzle and there's one piece missing, okay? And I don't know about you, but like, my brother didn't do this, but this is the kind of brother I had, like he would eat the last piece, so like you couldn't finish the puzzle. And you'd be like, dang man, where's my last piece? And like, I ate it, you know? So like, that's how I felt like my life was. Like, it, this picture, but it was missing a piece. And I couldn't find the piece. And when Jesus called me, I felt like he bent down on the ground and he found that puzzle piece and he put it in my soul and he made the picture complete. And I have known ever since that moment that Jesus was calling me to be his bride for all eternity. I've known ever since that moment. And I can tell you it has nothing to do with anything I deserved or any wonderful thing that I did to get that. But that's how God loves. That's how God loves us. And as you know, anybody who's made a commitment, if you've made an eternal commitment, whether to your spouse, to your family, you know that the beginning is, well, just the beginning. 
because saying yes to God was the best decision I made, but it was also the most challenging decision I've ever made. Because I have been purified and purified and purified and purified because we're so inundated with what the world teaches is love and commitment. What is true love? What is it? Sometimes we don't even know. Because I want to talk a little bit about chastity. And throughout my talks this weekend, I'm going to talk about some, you know, some sensitive things from the area of truth. I think there's things we need to talk about, the truth about ourselves. And Pope Benedict says in an encyclical, God is love, he says, in the end, love is not a feeling. Love is not merely a sentiment. Sentiments come and go. A sentiment can be a marvelous first spark, but it is not the fullness of love. The process of purification and maturation by which Eros comes fully into its own is always open-ended. Love is never finished and complete. Throughout life, it changes and matures, and thus remains faithful to itself. For our love to be authentic, it must be purified. So God comes to purify it because we're so full of ourselves and so full of our own disordered desires that we don't even realize it. So Jesus has to come and purify us. Because I didn't realize, we live in a very toxic culture. And especially, I think, the younger generation, um, it's just a very different mentality. Like when I talk to my mom, like her way of thinking and then the way my way of thinking is very, very different because I come from a far more toxic culture, I believe, than what she does. And so tell me if this sounds familiar, if this is what the way the world loves, okay, loves. Because usually what's passed off as love in the world is nothing but egocentric emotionalism, okay? So it's not true love. And it sounds something like this. If I could put a voice on this egocentric emotionalism, it says this. I feel good about you because you make me feel good and you're convenient. But when you don't make me feel good anymore and you become inconvenient or I have to suffer or sacrifice because of you, then we're done. Sound familiar? And what we don't realize that is deeply, deeply wounding to everybody involved. Because we're not meant to be used and then thrown away. If you look in the definition of our, in the catechism in the back, if you look in the glossary and you look at the definitions, under the definition for the human person, you'll find that one of the aspects of the human person, it says, is that we are someone, not something. Someone to be loved, to be valued. Someone that will never, ever be repeated again. From the beginning of time to the end of time, God will never recreate you. You won't be recycled. You won't come back as a green bean, you know? You're far too precious for that. And you know, that's why we don't believe in reincarnation, not because we think it's stupid, but because human beings are far too precious for that. We're far too unique for that. So that's why whenever somebody uses you, whatever they're using you for, that's why you don't like it. Automatically, it doesn't sit well with you because in your heart, even if you can't enunciate it, in your heart, you know, you're not supposed to be used. We are not to be used as a means to somebody else's end. So they can do what they want with us and then discard us when we're done. That is deeply, deeply wounding. And that is what passes off as love in the world today. So if we're not clear about what love is and what it means to love, what it means to love, then we're going to have a lot of problems. Because love, true love, does require death. It requires suffering. It requires sacrifice. True love is deep, authentic. When a man and a woman come together, they make their vows, and they say, I will love you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Through all things. And it was really beautiful. I had a chance to attend yet another um, Theology of the Body conference with Dr. Mikkel Waldstein, who retranslated the entire the work of Theology of the Body again. And he was, he's German. And he was saying that in Germany, the vow formula is not, it used to not, it's different now, but he said it used to be, instead of saying, I take you, you know, George is my husband and you, Monica's wife. What it used to be was, I am yours and you are mine forever. And there's something so true about that. That's, that's so deep, that deep kind of love that says, I am yours and you are mine forever. Never we shall part. And that is, that's a reflection of how we're loved. Because we want love like that. Our hearts desire and yearn for that. And what you see in the world today that's gone wrong, 